It is one thing to walk into a celebration feast and partake of the event, while it is entirely another to get so much involved in such jubilation to the extent that one supplies the ingredients for refreshments. That facilitation that Melchizedek accorded Abram's victory festivity is what particularly underscores the depth of his appeal on Abram's triumph over the enemy. The king of Salem literally presented the highly treasured refreshments of fresh bread and wine. It is this particular act of providing freshly baked bread and new wine that heavily scored in the spiritual realm as a symbolism of its own cotter. Knowing the order in which the ancient community of Abraham presented bread and wine, it can pass without contest that the king of righteousness must have attached greater significance to this initial encounter with mankind. The tradition of presenting the best wine first was indeed well established all through into the Canaan community of the New Testament. When all means of provision hands avail, the symbolism of Melchizedek's presentation of fresh wine at the height of exhaustion must not be taken lightly. Right from the onset, and without reading any further into it, it is so transparent that when all means humanly possible hit exhaustion, then the refreshing visitation of the Lord will always be available to those who are called and chosen into this contriteness of faith. We are reminded here that Abram further went on to be crowned the father of faith out of such a childlike heart. In the very brief, but highly profitable encounter between mankind and the divine envoy of heaven, one thing however comes out as significantly undaunting. This principally relates to the readings that the bread and wine avail in the spiritual realm. The fresh bread which Melchizedek endowed Abram's feast with, was an entirely iconical renourishment of the spiritual fresh bread that comes from heaven. It is such a wonder bread, that when every weary man whose being has been weighed down by the sin of this world, and in their commune of it, their replenishment is assured. And that the fresh wine whose refreshing sip soothed off Abram's exhaustion thereby invigorating him in abundant joy, symbolizes the life-replenishing blood of Jesus is a statement no one can gainsay. We are then prompted to now perceive the quality of fellowship Melchizedek's first encounter with mankind yielded. It is as much a prophetic as it was of symbolic visitation. Notwithstanding, the exact baseline that this novel fellowship between heaven and earth presents, is highly suggestive of a greater emphasis that heaven lays on humanity's triumph over the king of this world. God Almighty at this place made a blessed statement to the tune that he loves when mankind does tremendous exploits for his heavenly kingdom. Valley of S.H.A.V.E.H. The indulgence with which Melchizedek treated Abram in that visitation, was one of godly temperance that was deeply ingrained in righteousness. Though happening within the background of the catastrophic fall in the Garden of Eden, the rare merriment that Melchizedek's visitation bestowed on humanity was highly marked by a priceless endowment of heavenly tribute to the Church. One thing that now comes to light in that divine encounter is undoubtedly the deeper recognition with which heaven seems to have already earmarked the church as the future beneficiary of its eternal kingdom. However, he about whom all these things are mentioned, was most effectual in accomplishing his mission going to the fact that he bore to highly regarded offices. By virtue of his endless testimony, Melchizedek holds both the kingly and priestly offices which are the two most honorable crowns in the kingdom of God Almighty. It was deeply symbolic that Melchizedek as the king of righteousness chose to meet Abram at the valley of Shebat, and not anywhere else. Firstly, the valley of Shebat represented the valley of the kings. And in that depression, kings would meet and hammer out historic treaties and covenants for their respective jurisdictions. Such accords encompassed peace treaties that were signed during times of conflict and controversy between respective kingdoms. Likewise, 
certain market and trade treaties were equally endorsed at this valley of the kings, between not only monarchs but also their respective merchants. Such welfare-related agreements would permit preferential access to certain trade routes. For Melchizedek the king of righteousness to have also chosen such a venue of historic significance to fellowship with Abram, indelibly points at the nature of his mission. Considering that he appeared at that valley of Sheba, fully adorned in his royal crown, then undoubtedly, Melchizedek's communion with Abram greatly alluded to the church as God's choice over his kingly affairs. In order to surpass the impediment that the Garden of Eden's apostasy had laid before humanity, it had then become significant that Melchizedek's interaction with man had a serious spiritual consequence. At this place of the meeting, it had now become obvious that the church was rapidly transformed into heir apparent of the kingdom of God. Such a transfiguration would definitely require that the church eventually be enthroned in spiritual high places. By his landmark proclamations, the King of Righteousness ensured that God's sovereign appointment over mankind would assuredly be accomplished in the last days. Testament to those Valley of Sheva declarations arose this beautiful heavenly arpanage. Revelation 19, 14-15 says, The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. In all his assertions, Melchizedek as the king of Salem, must have indeed exalted righteousness as the foundation upon which man's eternity was now to experience a new dawn. Revelation 20 verse 4 says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. King of Salem even though the demand for confession of sin seemed to be new and most startling aspects of Melchizedek's visit, the bread and wine though, bespoke this new highway of repentance that God Almighty was now unveiling to humanity. By tithing a tenth of the exploits, Abram consented to the kinship as heir apparent, in the kingdom of Salem. It became an act that significantly transformed their relationship from the earthly realm of Sheba into the heavenly realm that which the greater finally blessed the lesser. Abraham's recognition of the king of Salem, principally laid the solid spiritual foundation for today's church as she aspires to inherit the kingdom of God. It then became well known that this newfound kinship of righteousness that Melchizedek advanced is what the church would soon be forced to sanction as a benchmark for enrollment into the glorious rapture. This essentially set in motion the process of unveiling the road map for the eventual redemption of mankind. The hallmark that Melchizedek bore as both the King of Righteousness and King of Salem, is what unraveled the objective of his mission. Very well knowing what was in his thoughts, we now see that as king of Salem, Melchizedek undeniably embodied the king of peace. This is what disclosed his appeals and denunciations, especially the interconnectedness between his crown of righteousness and the peace he had come to deliver upon humanity. By sitting at the helm of the dominion of righteousness, it is absolutely evident that Melchizedek's gifts of bread and wine were deliberately designed to relay the humble message of God's sacrifice unto mankind. He was making known that which he himself had heard from the throne of God Almighty regarding the cross that was oncoming. In which case the bread and wine that were presented at that table thoroughly foretold of his body that would be broken on the cross and the blood that would cleanse the sin of man. However, most intriguing is the fact that Melchizedek's manifestations proclaimed liberty to the captives given that his crown of righteousness unmistakably demanded a clear repentance from sin. 
It is this message of repentance that was in essence designed to return mankind into his dominion of righteousness and hence reconcile humanity with God. That became the historic place at which the Lord took upon himself humanity's weakness, by uniting his heavenly interests with those of fallen man, through the divinity of his righteous crown. By bringing this form of peace in the heart of Jerusalem, the king of Salem indeed brought peace into the hearts of men. It became the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding as this mighty heavenly emissary began ascending into heaven. Bearing the prayers of the needy and distressed humanity to the Father above, and unveiling blessings, hope, courage, help, and life eternal to the children of men. And thus Melchizedek became the medium of communication between man and God, and of God with man. In this way, he indeed bore the crown as the King of Peace, Prince of Salem. Melchizedek's bearing of the crown of King of Peace in essence located him to the messianic title of Prince of Peace. The Tent in Salem At the Promised Land the Lord gave Israel ample time to get accustomed to his divine presence, with a compassionate regard for their worship. This is what defined their nationhood as a covenant people of God, because they knew Jehovah. In the Hebrew context, Salem then became synonymous with the dwelling place of the Lord to the extent that he was depicted by the name Jehovah Shalom. Nevertheless, Locating and understanding the dominion of Salem that which Melchizedek reigns as priest of God Most High. It becomes extremely imperative to extract its original import. Psalm 76, 1-2 says. In Judah God is known, his name is great in Israel. His tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. The ancient words that define dwelling place or tent often related very closely in reference to the lion's den or a covered location. Astonishingly, when Israel dared to describe Jehovah their God, together with his marvelous and wondrous acts, their joy could no longer be hidden when they relayed him as a ferocious indomitable lion, whose reign is unchallengeable. That became the most remarkable salutation to the Lord's unassailable authority and power in the defense of Jerusalem, his royal city. That was the highest indication yet that the royal priesthood of Melchizedek was in fact the first incarnation of Christ the Messiah. This is because to the Lord Jesus alone, is the name the Lion of the tribe of Judah reserved. The case in reference relates closely to when the Lord annihilated Sennacherib's army when it threatened to wipe out Jerusalem with an obliterating attack. 2 Kings 19 verse 35, and Isaiah 37, 36 to 38 says, That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death a hundred and eighty-five thousand in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib king of Ashriah broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Hadramalat and Sherezer killed him with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And the Esser hadn't his son succeeded him as king. Upon their deliverance, Israel went into a relentless jubilation as they praised the mighty name of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It became the monumental intervention that quietened their fears, and quickened their faith, causing God to be well known in Judah and his name to be great in Israel. Departing from heaven with such an unspeakable joy, Melchizedek gladly blessed mankind in a manner that was highly suggestive of Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and never be closed. At these words, this heavenly messenger of God opened a new portal of communication with God. Since the eye of the Lord rested upon him, the king of Salem knew it too well that there was no greater authority beyond his, that could bless mankind. 
This blessing on Abraham would be necessary in order to establish and chart out the noble lineage of David through which he himself would be reincarnated as the Messiah, in order to redeem mankind from the cruel sting of death. Through this valley of Sheva blessing, Melchizedek gave to the world a unique example of a sinless life that initiated the process of reconciliation and peace between God and man. While he had often prayed for mankind in the secluded spot hidden in the foliage of God's glory, this time around the king of Salem brought his sacrifice of worship into Jerusalem. By his crown of righteousness, Melchizedek then decided to decree his eternal peace between humanity and God. Without waiting for a second bidding, this is what delivered mankind from what would have otherwise become the most humiliating eternal defeat. Out of this valley of Sheva communion, God Almighty would then permit him to face life's peril like every human being, and to fight the battle as every child must even unto the stake of failure and eternal loss. And of him that came to encounter mankind at the valley of Sheva, this is what was said. Psalm 10 verse 9 says, He lies in wait like a lion in cover, he lies in wait to catch the helpless, he catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed, they collapse, they fall under his strength. Astoundingly, in Salem where Jehovah dwells, it emerged that Melchizedek reserves the royal retreat of eternal dominion of divine jurisdiction as the priest of God Most High. As when the Deliverer had come to Israel's rescue, so it is that Melchizedek's covenant with man brought power, exaltation and triumph which are associated with his coming to crush the head of the serpent Genesis 3 verse 15. This delivered the most powerful payload that terminally crushed a king of this world, with his allies. Priest of God Most High Whilst still in the loins of his forefathers, Levi's priesthood had already been predetermined by the Lord, and the abating shortfall which would characterize the ironic watch. As a result, Melchizedek's meeting with Abraham essentially triggered off the inaugural debut of a new priestly dispensation, in which the clergy at hand would now have to present the supremacy far and above the Levitical pulpit. To offer sacrifice in the Levitical priesthood, one was required to be a Hebrew from the tribe of Levi. It is a constraint that virtually curved out the Gentile population. Such conditionality had been put in place by the Lord in order to serve the limited term, while securing the custodianship of the law, and its practice through the protection, and interpretation of God's infallible instruction. In this way, the integrity of the Lord's house was jealously preserved. Meanwhile, having lived its full term, there arose a need for a new order of priesthood one that would not require a rigorous benchmark of annual sacrifice. The shortcomings of the Levitical priesthood had then come to bear going to the temporary nature of their sacrifice. At the Valley of Sheva presentation of bread and wine, Jehovah had already made his intentions known on the need to offer a perfect sacrifice whose redemptive atonement would endure forever and ever. Likewise, the heart of God Almighty began to desperately yearn for the engrafting of the Gentile Church. To the extent that he looked into the face of the believers and trembled at the mere thought of their life's peril. Wherefore, the induction of a new priesthood, would have to well align with the new dispensation of open heaven that Melchizedek had now pronounced in Jerusalem. A transitioning was now underway in the heavenly council of God Almighty. After the order of Melchizedek would now emerge a new clergy, one about whom Moses never even mentioned anything with regard to priesthood. This represented a major fundamental spiritual change at the altar of sacrifice, and an obvious landmark in the salvation of both the Gentile and Hebrew churches. Hebrew 10 13-15 says, 
for the one of whom these things are said belong not to the priestly line but to another tribe, no member of which has officiated at the altar. For it is obvious that our Lord sprang from the tribe of Judah, and Moses mentioned nothing about priests in connection with that tribe. 15 And this becomes more plainly evident when another priest arises who bears the likeness of Melchizedek. Because the Lord longed to shield his dear ones from the enemy's power and avoid a bitter conflict in his own law, the tribe of Judah became not only the praise of the lofty one, but also the Melchizedek pulpit was launched. That the path of light might be made sure for both the Gentile and the Hebrew church, the lion of the tribe of Judah certainly had to first appear with the crown of the Melchizedek priesthood, and bless his own path towards the final redemption of mankind. Psalm 76 verse 2 says, His tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. With these novel words the Israelites adorned the Lord without knowing that their description of his majesty directly pointed at Christ Jesus the Messiah as Melchizedek the high priest of God Most High. Such a change of guard as was now taking place at the pulpit, meant that there must have been a greater need to execute a change in the law from the Aaronic precepts into the new law of the grace. In contemplation to the advent of the coming of the Messiah, this new law of the grace that Melchizedek ushered into the spiritual landscape, became extremely beneficial to the body of Christ because it birthed out the spiritual church and centralized Jesus as the eternal priest of God Most High. He appeared with such a heredity to share with penitent sinners, so that in his supremacy as the light of the world, we too in our weakness of humanity, might be permitted to bear that light on Melchizedek's day. That light is the righteousness that bound the fine linen of our hearts. The failure to uphold this wonderful light on that anticipated Melchizedek's day, becomes the greatest risk upon the face of humanity and the entire earth. The foreshadow. When Abraham inadvertently stumbled upon Melchizedek in that blessed valley of Sheba, his will must have consented as faithlessness let go its hold upon him. He must have refrained from the slightest acceptance of any doubt in his mind. And yet in all this, mankind knew it not that this would actually turn out to be the most consecrated unveiling of Christ's incarnation. And because the nations dealt in the worship of idols, without Abraham, they would have beheld indifference to him whom God had sent to communicate to this dark world, the light of sacred truth. None of the powers of earth or hell could impede Melchizedek the king of Salem, in the slightest degree, from accomplishing the will of the Father to bless humanity with the salvation of the cross. Most revealing of Melchizedek's visitation though, was his signaling that declared the insightful glad news to the nations, on what was just about to happen on the front of mankind's redemption. And because Melchizedek found Abraham true to his trust, he developed a deeper and more zealous interest in Abraham's political victory over those enemy kings. Abraham had defeated those kings by literally slaughtering Cabor Lander with his allies in that dispensation of darkness. This in essence compelled the king of righteousness to share in the joy of heralding the exploits and plunder because those evil kings had now been crushed, in a symbolic battle. This definitely asserts that every trustful desire we cherish in our hearts towards the Lord, without a doubt affords him a major foothold into our lives. Abraham did not yield to the wicked pressure from those evil kings but opted to do battle with them. In the backdrop of evil within which Abraham enjoyed the military victory, this further testifies to us that the tempter can definitely never compel mankind to do evil, and neither can the tempter's schemes control our minds unless they are voluntarily yielded to his wicked influence. Finding him virtually weary and unrecognized, 
Melchizedek the king of righteousness practically removed Abraham from a vainly extremity into a joyous and most celebratory place that would later become iconical of the things to be. Beyond the hills of the valley of Sheba, the Lord was using Abraham's celebratory victory to foretell the dispensation when the Messiah would appear and crush the dominion of the kingdom of darkness, with all its allied kings of this world. This is what caused God Almighty in heaven to immediately present Melchizedek in the presence of victorious Abraham in a depiction that highlighted the coming days when the righteous church would be brighter with the glory of his presence at the marriage supper of the Lamb. The exaltation and triumph associated with Melchizedek's sudden appearance at Abraham's victory party denoted the exhilaration that he asked the Lord of the armies would do at the fullness of time, to set his flock free from the reign of this dark world. He about whom these beautiful things were mentioned, was indeed already crowned in the castles of heaven as the promised Saviour. When Abraham was at the point of weariness and lonesomeness following that protracted battle with the kingdoms of darkness, then the heavenly envoy is suddenly sent to comfort him from being sore and frail. The compassion of God Almighty was indeed well manifest at that Jerusalem valley. For God Almighty in heaven had then decisively intended that through this encounter, mankind would have to fear not, for behold good news had now come for all peoples, that unto them, the Saviour would have to be born, which is Christ the Lord. This first incarnation and prefiguration of what the Lord Jesus would do upon his advent as Christ the King, is what would also decorate him as the Lord of the armies. When the Lord Jesus appeared as Melchizedek, costumed with the crown of priest of God Most High, a lot must have been at stake especially considering the disobedience within which he would operate. In this way, he was very much aware that in that incarnate form, God Almighty in heaven would assuredly interpose to deliver him whatever the circumstance. Melchizedek's abrupt appearance into the scene certainly claimed the true test of the fidelity and the obedience of steadfastness to the Holy Spirit, with which he would stoop low to redeem mankind, as Christ Jesus. As all actions foreshadows a form of the future, so did the vast terrain of land that Abraham was given, stretching as far as his eyes could reach fundamentally foretell of the vastness of the dominion of the upcoming boundless reign of Christ. Without a doubt, we can now clearly see that Melchizedek's advent was a very mighty prophetic act that God was putting in place to greet sinful man with his mercy. No wonder it is said of him, expand your mighty scepter implying that he would indeed expand his reign in ever-widening circles until no foe is left to oppose his rule. In this context, it was clearly set forth before him, that he would rule as the great king, the Lord's anointed one over God's victorious kingdom in the world. Such a dispensation will realize during the millennial rule of Christ. In what appears to be the initial attempt to quieten the adversary, sheep in this valley of Sheba, Fellowship was the grand portrayal of the swaddled mighty victory with which Christ the Messiah would later vanquish the enemies of God at the cross. This feat would be unsheathed at his royal footstool. Psalm 110, 4-6 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. One can only imagine the momentous joy that beheld heaven concerning that prophetic visitation. No longer could such a glory be held back by Jehovah hence causing heaven to send Melchizedek upon this otherwise hushed earth.
the valley of Sheva dialogue therefore realized the true signal that in heaven the veil of secrecy which guarded man's redemption plan had now been lifted. This birth figured out the greatest advancement of goodwill towards man. Now that the heavenly censorship over he that would come soon, the Messiah, had just been lifted. Very much aware that any failure on the part of this great prophetic visitation would only give occasion for the adversary to further reproach Christ, Melchizedek decreed an everlasting kinship between himself and mankind. That eternal bond of kinship was sealed for both the Gentile and Hebrew churches as a lasting ordinance that saw Abraham crowned father of faith. This pronouncement radically transformed the life of Abraham to the extent that he became the covered father of all who believed in Melchizedek, the Christ. Romans 4 verse 11 says, And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. Bread and the Cross While it may be true that God preserves all who walk in his righteous path of obedience, on the other hand departing from it constitutes a wild venture into Satan's dangerous domain. Hence, arising from this fear that those who are ignorant may be easily led astray, the Lord decided to keep mankind away from rushing unbidden down this road of danger, by sending Melchizedek king of Salem. This is what caused God's resolve to chart for mankind his secure highway of holiness Isaiah 35, 8-9. Appreciating this prophetic significance that Melchizedek brought into the body of Christ, comes from a greater degree of insight into the revelation of his righteous mission to a fallen earth. Going to the fact that the Lord envisioned the beginning from the end, he already perceived the need to establish the institution of the cross, and Melchizedek priest of God Most High had been slated to realize this sacred undertaking. While on the Day of Atonement the Levitical priesthood would be expected to pass from the sight of the people into the most holy place, annually. The placing of the bread before humanity on the other hand, unveiled an eternal priesthood whose sacrifice would be performed once for all. The slaughter animals for sacrifice, for sin offering and the transfer of blood behind the curtain in the most holy place would have to come to an end since now the higher cotter of sacrifice had been allotted to befit the spiritual dispensation that was at hand in that valley of Sheva. The priest's annual entry with the blood of an animal into the most holy place would have to come to an end because Christ Jesus the high priest of God would now enter into the inner chambers of God's temple in heaven, and sprinkle his own blood on the cover of the Ark of the New Covenant of God in heaven. That is the inner chamber act whose symbolism Melchizedek's new wine beheld at the valley of Sheva. The declaration of kinship that accrued during Melchizedek's visit is what foretold the anchoring of all the souls of men that would happen in the heavenly holy of holies upon Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Instead of the temporary atonement the Levitical priesthood achieved due to the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites, the bread that presented in Melchizedek's visitation designated he whose body would be broken once for all to eternally atone for the sins of man. The scripture has plainly put it that the way that leads into the kingdom of God has to pass through the cross. Thence, Cladded with the crown and garment of righteousness, Melchizedek indeed unveiled the cross at Calvary for the first time. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John 6:33. As Melchizedek presented bread to Abraham, these are the words that came forth from his generosity. In other words, the king of righteousness said, I bring life and life eternal unto this perishing world. As that Melchizedek's bread designated the cross, 
then it is also factual that truly the cross is what gives life eternal to mankind. Like it was with the Levitical priesthood whose service came to full term, thereby demanding the graduation of worship into the spiritual realm. So was it with the bread whose significance unveiled not only the dispensation of the manna from heaven, but also the coming of the true bread that is the Son of Man. Melchizedek's Day The Light of Righteousness When at the Valley of Sheba, Melchizedek pointed to humanity that the Lamb of God would now become a new light shed upon this dark world and that Christ the Messiah was already ordained at the throne of God as the suffering sacrifice and conquering king. By wearing the crown of righteousness, Melchizedek indeed conveyed the message that the significance of his mission was deeper than that of priests and the people. When the God of heaven typed on that white piece of paper a message that said, Melchizedek's day is known as the day of light. It became a very serious awakening in the Church of Christ. Having come to man, while fully clad with the crown of the King of Righteousness, this note on Melchizedek's day becomes highly expressive of an unutterable grace of God. However, in order to best comprehend what the day of light clearly implies, it is significant to tap into the basic expectations that God has laid for that day of rapture. If that day belongs to the Messiah, then it is absolutely prudent to fully explore all the aspects of the Messiah's advent and his mission. Righteousness Right from the word go, the prophecies that foretold of his coming laid down a fundamental threshold that he would register in heaven. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We see very clearly that the prophecies which charted his path towards the redemption of mankind, certainly highlighted the righteousness that he would come and establish forever. Therefore. If the day of Melchizedek is earmarked as the day of light, then invariably that light must be the righteousness that the Lord was sent to bring upon the face of the earth. The garment of fine linen bright and clean that the Lord so craves the church to be clothed in on that auspicious day of rapture, is as a matter of fact the nurtured righteousness of the believers. And because the church has been called to walk after Christ the Messiah himself, then consistently we can now understand the requirement that the November 14, 2010 vision laid before mankind. If the righteousness with which the Messiah appeared on the earth is what caused the Redeemer to have the zeal of the Lord, then surely this written note summons the church to show forth fruit if the zeal of the Lord as the testament of the righteousness of their walk. Jehovah is in this day and age seeking a church that will be in confidence and eternal peace with him. Such everlasting peace between the body of Christ and God Almighty arises from the repentance and turning away from sin that righteousness institutes in the hearts of the believers. Isaiah 32 verse 17 and Isaiah 11, 3-5 Of all the attributes of salvation that Christ brought, Heaven appears to uphold the greater degree of reverence on righteousness. Such is the popular enthusiasm on righteousness, to the extent that even when it came to discerning who among men genuinely seek God, heaven would be obliged to employ that same yardstick. The pursuit of righteousness directly translates into the seeking of the Lord. The righteous church would never in any way forsake the rock from which she were cut nor the quarry from where she was hewn. This particularly to ours high especially at this last minute when the larger part of the body of Christ has forgotten about the rock of their salvation and embraced a compromise living Isaiah 51, 1-2. These invaluable attributes of righteousness are the ones that in effect constitute the radiance of the light of the world that Christ is. 
This heavenly written note of God hence essentially proclaims to the Church on the greater need to emit the radiance of this light at this moment, because this is the hour of righteousness in the Church. And only the believer whose lamp of salvation will emit such a brilliance of righteousness, will partake of Melchizedek's day of light rapture. By this November 14th vision of the type note from heaven, it is obvious that heaven upholds a higher plane of admiration for a righteous church. This principally boils down to the fact that in the gospel that Jesus brought, the righteousness of God ought to be revealed. It is an indictment that raises a number of questions against the present-day body of Christ. In this vision, the Lord's eloquence in questioning for righteousness does not exude from today's church, is noticeable. If at all it can be true that the present-day church received this same gospel of Christ Jesus, then the haunting question becomes why haven't they emitted the brilliance of the light of righteousness? As a matter of fact faith must be sanctioned as the outcome of righteousness. God Almighty is not seeking the approval of man, but in essence warning that faith in the Lord Jesus must rest on the bedrock of righteousness, has its foundation. Only those that walk in righteousness indeed demonstrate their faith in Jehovah God, through Christ Jesus Romans 1 verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The humility and self-sacrificing grace demonstrated in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 was designed to impress on us the very core of the Lord's mission. It is a marvelous awakening to realize that on that Calvary cross God sent Christ to bring mankind only one treasure called righteousness. And if the path that leads to the kingdom of God is through this very cross, then assuredly Melchizedek's day is indeed the day of righteousness. This generation that receives written notes from God must surely be that most celebrated generation of righteousness. Are you part of this righteousness? From the days of old to date, when a monarch journeys through the lesser frequented part of his kingdom, an advanced team is often sent the head of the royal entourage to level the bumps, and fill up the potholes, that the king may travel safely and without any hindrances, whatsoever. So was the purpose of this heavenly note that the Lord posted ahead Messiah's entourage that is upcoming. Often when the populace detect a certain type of presidential crew preparing the roads, marking the lanes and sweeping the pathways, then the message is always clear, that shortly, the king will pass here. And definitely it is now evident that this leveling of spiritual bumps and exalting of potholes that we see happening through this instructive note, implies that a highway for our God is being built and that sooner than later the king will pass here. Many times when soldiers and police officers are assigned a task, they are often given bulletproof jackets that protect the area above their chest and upper abdomen. That is usually intended to shield their vital organs during the combat. And when the fight gets quite brutal and messy, upon being rushed to hospital, the first things the doctors would check is what is done. Vital functions. Among the organs that are first examined is always the heart, to see if the heart function can still sustain life by pumping blood to the entire body. Today too. The present-day Church of Christ is involved in a very bruising battle, and many times it is critical to examine her vital functions whether they have not been damaged. We know it too well that when the Lord Jesus went to the cross, he did so to save the one and only thing called the heart of men. God's fascination with righteousness can now be well understood. Because the Bible commands the body of Christ to stand firm having their loins girt about with truth, and having in place the breastplate of righteousness Ephesians 6 verse 14. 
that tells us that God's cry for the church to be righteous is without a doubt purposed to shield their hearts from the sharp arrows of the enemy, that their spiritual vital functions may remain sound in order to sustain their salvation. Many of those gathering at churches today do so yearning to one day be like Christ Jesus their Redeemer. Often the presence of salvation in our lives is directly derived from God's blueprint of man's creation that which he intended humanity to bear his image and likeness. Genesis 1 verse 26. However, what the majority of believers have not understood is that to bear the image and likeness of God. The body of Christ must walk in true righteousness. That is the very conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus on the subject of being born again. The new spiritual rebirth that is graced by the salvation of the gospel, irrefutably involves putting on a new self that is created to be like God in true righteousness. Righteousness of the church is the true image and likeness of God in the sanctuary. When God Almighty on that November 14, 2010 sent me a well-typed note that says, Melchizedek's day is known as the day of light. He conclusively decreed that the light of God that brings man into his eternal kingdom is incontrovertibly the righteousness of their hearts. 2 Peter 3 verse 13 says, But in keeping with his promise we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells.